So last Sunday, I asked this question. How do we represent Christ as individuals and as a congregation? And I hinted that there would be a sermon series. So for the next several Sundays, including today, obviously, we're going to look at a few different ways to do that. Um, and we've done this in different ways already. Like the, we've already looked at uh, scriptures related to stewardship, right, including self-care. And that would obviously be a timely uh, topic at the beginning of the new year because we've probably all gorged ourselves on unhealthy food over Christmas or uh, even back to Thanksgiving. And we could all use a reminder from time to time to take care of ourselves um, and, and how that is reflected in scripture. And we've also looked at scriptures which challenge us to, you know, love our enemies and reach out to those um, in our midst who are dealing with difficult things. But instead, as we think about how we represent Christ, we're going to focus on a few areas that maybe we haven't spent as much time on. Today, we're going to be looking at praying like Jesus, but we're also going to, in the next couple weeks, talk about how we spend money. I know that's a stewardship thing, but there's a lot about what Jesus says that isn't just about giving money to the church, which is typically what we talk about for stewardship. And we're also going to talk about how Jesus advises us uh, and the disciples to handle conflict always a topic that we want to deal with, right? In a way, these topics are what would Jesus do type studies. Uh, Susan and I were joking about that. <laughs> she asked me if I was going to hand out the what would Jesus do bracelets. <laughs> um, as someone who uh, was a, a young person when that was the fad, I think I had a bracelet or two or at least a keychain or something. Um, and so that has it has made an impact on me because uh, it was such an integral part of my faith formation. But it's, it's very relevant to us. If we can look to Jesus when we have a dilemma, then we're probably going to fare better than if we look other places for answers. So one thing, though, that is tricky about having these types of conversations is that most often when we have a dilemma, Christians are prone to going to the Bible and uh, interacting, it, interacting with it as an instruction, instruction manual for life. And that's fine, but sometimes we come up empty handed because the Bible does not talk to us about every single thing we might deal with. Right? Precisely because the scriptures was not written for that purpose. Instead, it tells the story of God's people, both Jewish and beyond, as they have wrestled with what it means to live in relationship with God. So, even though today uh, is, today's sermon is entitled Praying Like Jesus, it's more about how Jesus taught others to nurture their relationship with God. As well as that, as well as what that looked like for him. When I was thinking about Jesus praying, some of the first scriptures that came to mind were not actually the ones I read earlier from Matthew and Luke. Actually, it was the very short, often overlooked scriptures that came to mind first, like Luke 5:16. But he, Jesus, with, would withdraw to deserted places and pray. We know that Jesus prayed, right? Like the video earlier illustrated that in a different way. Jesus prayed after ministering to great crowds. He prayed with the disciples even and more often alone. At least if we look at just what scripture tells us. And both Matthew and Mark record him praying multiple times in the garden at Gethsemane before his arrest and crucifixion. In those particular scriptures, we hear Jesus go to God asking to be delivered from what would happen next to him. 
Jesus found solitude in gardens and on mountaintops, even in the wilderness. We also know that he offered blessings for meals, probably very similar in wording to what other practicing Jews were saying or singing at mealtimes at the time. In terms of spiritual practices, prayer was certainly one that Jesus took seriously. And the disciples picked up on that and asked Jesus how they should pray, which is where we get the scripture uh, from Matthew 6, 9 through 15, which I read earlier. Uh, but it's also recorded in Luke 11. We know this as the Lord's Prayer. This is not something that uh, is really new to us. Many of us probably was uh, required to re uh, recite it as a kid or learn it, memorize it as children. But no matter when we first encountered the Lord's Prayer, whether we knew it came from Matthew 6 and Luke 11 or not, we should always read the words carefully. Sorry. We should always read the words carefully and consider what else Jesus said before these verses, right? Context is very important. The prayer itself is founded in a hope of God's kingdom being restored here on earth and a willingness on the person on the part of the person praying to submit oneself to God. But it also convicts those who are praying the prayer to a life characterized by forgiveness and desiring only what we need for the day. Jesus prefaced all of this, in Matthew at least, uh, with further instruction, and he did the same in Luke too. But he says things like, don't pray like the hypocrites, for they love to pray in the synagogue or on the street corners so that they might be seen and heard by others. Instead, Jesus said, look for, seek out quiet places to pray. And don't try to flatter God with your prayers either, offering up empty phrases. He told them the Gentiles think their prayers matter more because of how long they are. God knows our needs. You don't need to pile on the words to get through to God. Of course, that's my paraphrase. But even when Jesus taught them about other spiritual practices, such as almsgiving, which we would call charitable giving today, or fasting, the bottom line always was to not make a big deal about your actions. Corporate worship, which is what we're doing right now and we'll, what we do every week, is a public act. But not everything we do to nurture our relationship with God needs to be a public act. Jesus lived this by example every time he sought out quiet places to pray. Now, in addition to Jesus practicing and teaching on prayer, we also know that he challenged the rules on other certain spiritual practices, such as observing the Sabbath or Shabbat in Hebrew. Jesus uh, made it very clear where he stood on some things, but he also uh, knew how to challenge the rules without, um, without necessarily redefining them in a prescribed way. He was really good at asking questions and telling stories. At this time, Jews were not supposed to do much of anything on the Sabbath. For Orthodox Jews who practice their faith now, it's still the same. For a whole 24 hours from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, that was Sabbath, that was Shabbat. You weren't supposed to do anything. But we have several stories like this, uh, these verses from Luke 6, where Jesus doesn't quite follow the rules. In this particular story, Jesus and his disciples were out walking and happened to pick some grain from a field and eat it. We've probably heard this scripture before. When questioned about their actions, Jesus reminded the folks questioning him, the scribes and Pharisees, that King David also ate on the Sabbath when he was hungry. And then 
On another Sabbath, and these are the verses that come right after it, back to back in the text, it says that Jesus defied the law again by healing a man with a withered hand while preaching in the synagogue, knowing full well that the scribes and Pharisees were sitting there watching, silently daring him to do such a thing. In this particular instance, Jesus asked the question, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath to save life or to destroy it? Interestingly enough, the verse that comes after this, verse 12, tells us that Jesus retreated to a nearby mountain to pray. One of the first classes I had in seminary focused on spiritual practices. When I did internships uh, to prepare for entering the set-apart ministry, I was required to have several goals, one of which had to be focused on a spiritual practice. And the reason for all of that, I think, is pretty self-evident. We have to stay grounded in God, especially when we're in the ministry, but also just as practicing Christians. Now, some of you here and those who are not here would, I know, would feel spiritually lost without their daily Bible or devotion reading. For other, others of us, we might not rely on a daily practice, but just rely on Sunday morning worship to call us back to God. Or it might be something as simple as praying a short prayer before we get up or go to bed. I know others uh, who do actually fast, perhaps not always from food, but maybe sometimes from technology. It allows us to reorient our brains sometimes. And there are many different types of spiritual practice out there. Even taking a walk can be a good time to connect with God. Here's the thing though. When we think about approaching scripture, right, for how to do things and what Jesus says, Jesus never said that there was only one right way to nurture our relationship with God. He doesn't say, go and do this every day and you'll have a good relationship with God. That's not how he worked. And when others try to remind him that there was just one right way of doing things, such as how Shabbat had to be observed, he proved the scribes and Pharisees wrong. It didn't matter if one followed all of the rules or did things just to say that they had done them. It didn't matter whether one's prayers were long and lofty or spoken out loud for others to hear, or if they were short and filled with passion. Those things didn't necessarily always matter because we don't have to pr prove our faithfulness to others. What matters more, I believe, and this, I think, comes out in our parable that Jesus uh, shared and that we have in Luke 18. We're told here that Jesus only told this parable to those who thought themselves more righteous than others, which is, I find to be very fascinating because he's usually talking to large crowds or just to the disciples. He's not usually trying to signal or single pe people out all the time and to call them out on stuff, at least uh, not outside of the scribes and Pharisees. But in this case, right, he's telling this parable to some folks who thought that they were more righteous than others. And it kind of starts out like a bad joke, right? Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and other a tax, tax collector. It's kind of like a Pharisee and a tax collector went up to the temple to pray, right? It's not a bar, <laughs> but it kind of sounds like that. But then Jesus gets right to the point. And he tells us how the two men prayed. The Pharisee's prayer God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector guy over here. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. The tax collector's prayer, though. It 
if it will go. There we go. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus then explained that the tax collector's prayer was more sincere. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I can't help but think that, and this is a funny thing, but I can't help but think when Jesus was telling this, had this not been just a parable, but something that actually happened, that when he heard the Pharisee's prayer and compared it to the tax collector's prayer, that he wouldn't have channeled his inner church lady from Saturday Night Live, if it's going to work for me. And so, well, isn't that special, right? That Pharisee's prayer, isn't that special? You just think so highly of yourself, don't you? Now, Jesus doesn't say that, but he did say very clearly that those who exalt themselves, whether it's to God or others, will be humbled, and those who humble themselves before God and others will be exalted. What matters more than having the best prayers or reading the most uh, sought-after devotional or even climbing the highest mountain in which to seek God is doing whatever we do with humility. For Jesus, as a public figure of his day, that meant retreating to pray alone. At least then the words he spoke and the actions that he uh, carried out during his prayer time would, wouldn't have been scrutinized by the crowd. But it was also a time to set himself apart from the world. To take a break from being this young and fabulous rabbi that everyone wanted to get to know. And just be alone with God. Now some of us are better at these things than others. I for one... <laughs> am horrible when it comes to sticking with a spiritual practice. It's always been that way. I've never been able to stick with one for long. And it's even more difficult now uh, because solitude as a mom does not come often. I used to rely on my gardening time and outside time, playing in the dirt, getting back to, you know, getting grounded, so to speak, as an opportunity to be with God alone. Now I spend a lot of that time keeping an eye on Evelyn and making sure that she doesn't eat too much dirt. <laughs> Life circumstances don't always make it easy for us to nurture our relationship with God. And I believe Jesus understood that. So no matter what we do to nurture our relationships with God, remember that it's not so much about the what or the how, but more about the why. Whether we pray, write, walk, read, sing, give, fast, or play in the soil, may all that we do be done with humility while willingly, like that tax collector, confessing our humanity to God. May it be so. Amen.